Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming here on Friday, which is officially part of the weekend here at Columbia. Uh, so it's good to see you all this morning. Uh, my name is Charles Armstrong. I'm the director of the Center for Korean Research. And it's a great pleasure to introduce this symposium uh, and the work of Theodore Conant in the area of film related to Korea. I'd like to thank our co-sponsor, the Star Library, as well as the assistance of the Korea Foundation, the Columbia University Libraries, Department of East Asian Languages and Culture, Department of History, uh, and the School of Arts uh, uh, Film MA program for all their support on making this possible. Good morning. My name is Jim Neal. I'm the university librarian here at Columbia, and we're uh, very, very honored to be a uh, part of this event. Um, I remember that my earliest awareness of the world uh, as a child was through the lens of the Korean War. And much of that was through the films and television that was uh, entering our homes and entering our, our theaters. And so a lot of my earliest memories are, are not obviously from the literature, but from the, from the videos and, and, uh, and accounts uh, that came, came, came to us uh, in those early 1950s. So it is appropriate, I think, for us to be celebrating here today uh, the uh, extraordinary work of Mr. Conant and the uh, generosity of sharing uh, this uh, uh, record, this archive of that period uh, with faculty, uh, with researchers, and most importantly, with our students uh, here at Columbia. Uh, this event is a scholarly recognition of the Korean War and its importance in world history and its importance in the history of this country. It's a celebration of film, uh, a recognition that film increasingly plays a, a very fundamental role uh, in scholarly work. And we're honored here at Columbia to have these films as well as uh, an extraordinarily and rapidly expanding research base of film materials. It's a celebration of the creators, those who were brave and, and forthright and, and took all the risk and provided all the innovation in capturing this record that now can be shared and, and made available. This is really also about the research library. Uh, taking on these types of materials and these types of archives is what we do. Uh, in a world in which everyone seems to have access to everything uh, through, through all kinds of devices and all kinds of networks, it's that distinctive, unique material uh, like uh, the Conan Gift which defines the research library going forward. And we're honored to work with the center um, and with the uh, faculty and researchers across the world who care about this material. But having taken it on, having brought it to Columbia and wanting to make it available, we also have a responsibility for its long-term preservation. Unfortunately, the mediums uh, in which we captured this record um, uh, suffer uh, the ravages of time. Uh, and therefore, working with the Korean uh, Film archives and our partnership through uh, Bi Hong Lee, uh, we're able to take responsibility for digitizing and preserving this material so that people will continue to have access to this important record uh, about a very critical period in our history, uh, in the history of the world. So we are celebrating many things today through this symposium, and the university libraries are honored to be part of it, and we're very thankful to you for making these materials available through the libraries here at Columbia. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jim Chen. I'm the director of the uh, CV Star East Asian Library. And at first, I would like to thank Mr. Conan for his generosity and of donating his treasure, his unique collection, to the CV Star East Asian Library and for sharing it with the world. And secondly, I would like to salute to uh, Director Lee and for uh, working with the uh, Columbia University Library to digitize these special materials for the world. And also, I would like to thank my predecessor, Amy Hendrick, and uh, she secured uh, the donation several years ago, and I said it's, uh, she planted the seeds, now we enjoy the fruits. Without further ado, uh, I want to uh, introduce uh, my colleague, <coughs> He Suk Shin, to give a more detailed introduction of the Conan Collection. He Suk. Good morning and welcome all of you. I'm very happy to be part of this event, and I hope uh, my presentation will help you to understand the more about the Conant Collection. Gift plays a very important role in the development of, uh, of library collections, such as the CV Star East Asian Library. 
Theodore Richard Conant kindly donated his unique collection, which was established in 2008 in the East Asian Library. Today, I would like to briefly introduce and speak about how Mr. Conant was involved in the Korean War and the history of Korean films. Then I will talk briefly on how we acquired his collection, followed by the what types of materials are included and how to access the collection. Some of you may know that Mr. Conant was a filmmaker who contributed to the advance of Korean film technology in the 1950s. He worked at the United Nations Korean Reconstruction Agency, UNCRA, and as a Syracuse contractor under the Onondaga Earth Corps from 1952 to 1960. He was dispatched to Korea in 1952 through UNCRA and participated as a recording engineer in Alfred Wegg's documentary film, Long Journey, and lived in Korea until 1960. During the project, Mr. Conant met Hyung Pyo Lee, who was a Korean film worker at UNCRA. The film was never completed, but according to an interview with the Korean Film Archive, Mr. Conant said that he com uh, later completed it, uh, which is included in our collection. And while he stays in Korea, he had a good, a good relationship with the Korean filmmakers. And his contributions to the film of Korean films include list film equipment and taught recording techniques to Korean filmmakers and provides books and CDs which were not available during that time and consulted and assisted purchasing the RCA magnetic recorder for the Bureau of Public Information Korea in 1950s. Thereafter, Mr. Conant and Mr. Lee founded the Peninsula Studio and produced newsreels for NBC and CBS, and the UN radio and TV documentary program for the United Nations and the U.S. Army from 1952 to 1953. In addition to this, they worked together to produce documentary films such as Korean art and Korean fantasy, and uh, children in crisis. We begin with children in crisis. Uh, I'm afraid in the interest of time, we may not get to uh, the fifth film listed in the program, I Am a Truck, which is a fascinating film by Kim Gyeon. Uh, but we do not have an English subtitled version, so it would have been some difficult to access. Uh, it's, if you can imagine, a sort of early post-war Korea proto-transformers film uh, in which the lead <laughs> character is a, is a truck. Um, so it's a fascinating sort of surrealistic film. Um, we'll try to show a bit of it if we get to it, but let's begin uh, with this. All right, we now have the uh, honor and privilege of interviewing the man himself. And I'd like to leave some time at the end for some questions uh, from the audience as well, if you don't mind, Ted. Um, we have about an hour. I know, Ted, you could speak all day. In, in fact, for several days uh, on this uh, subject without, without taking a breath. But we, we do have a somewhat limited time as uh, this, is, this part of the program is all that's standing between us and, and lunch. So um, let, let me begin uh, at the beginning and ask you, uh, what was it that brought you to Korea? And, and what did you find that Korea was like when you got there? Well, I was very, had some very fortunate breaks in life. Uh, when I was a teenager, my father, of course, was working very hard to help England. Uh, and uh, he was terrified that the Germans would invade England. And uh, he helped, he organized the committee to, to defend America by aiding allies, along with a well-known journalist named White, Middle Western journalist. And they were, Mr. Lindbergh, of course, opposed that. And Mr. Lindbergh felt we should cooperate with the Germans. He, he admired German aviation progress. There were big meetings in Madison Square Garden and in, and in Boston and so on. I went to some of them and I cheered the uh, 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 
people who wanted to help England and booed at the America Firstus. But uh, out of that, uh, I did get to uh, meet a lot of British engineers and a lot of members of the British Secret Police and uh, learn something about uh, film te technology and uh, under wartime conditions. And I volunteered uh, out of high school. I dropped out of the last year of prep school. And they were desperate for radio operators because the German U-boats were decimating uh, uh, the American fleet and, and supplies to England. And, they, and I had uh, all the commercial licenses that the government issues for the Federal Communication Commission, first to the radio amateur and then to the com commercial uh, purposes. And the fact that I had the licenses and, and, and knew a good deal about uh, telecommunications they uh, waived the physical requirements of age and, and medical conditions and uh, Tramp ran me through the Coast Guard boot camp in, in New York, on an island in New York, Sheepshead Bay, and then on a remote island, Hoffman Island, New York Harbor, cryptography and advanced telecommunication. And then I had a choice and I chose the West Coast. I thought it was a little, the Japanese and uh, kamikaze uh, was, was a little safer than the icebergs and, and the German U-boats and more interesting. And so I was, during the war, I was on about four different kinds of ships all through the, the uh, Western Pacific first, uh, and learned a lot about technology and about Asia and then with the desire to go back to Asia because I went to Okinawa and uh, Tinian and Guam and the Dutch East Indies and all of that. And uh, so I went to college, made a few films on the side, worked in a, in a few, for a few electronic firms on the side. And then I heard that uh, the UN was looking for people who were willing to go to Korea and make a feature film in Korea about what the UN was doing and so on. And I immediately jumped at the chance. And after a while, they decided to take me because a lot of other people didn't want to go. They thought it would be too dangerous. And they didn't want to be away from the United States that, for a long period. And, uh, and some of that was good because they, they raised the ante. We finally settled. I would go for several weeks to help uh, a guy named Alfred Wagg, who never made a, had never made a film, but was a very good still photographer and a superb public relations type. And uh, they hired a very good cameraman who had made some the good documentaries. And it was Wag, Bag, Bagley, Wagley, and Conan, I think, were what it jokingly called. And uh, we were flown out to Korea. And uh, it, that's how I came to, came to Korea. And I stayed on after that, that particular film project was finished and did work for the BBC with the coronate, big British coronation ceremonies in England. And they wanted live broadcasts from Her Majesty's forces in Korea. And so I did quite a number of live, range of a lot of live transmissions and also films about the ruin. And they were, they, they were strictly hammed up. I mean, I mean, I'd get dust off pictures of the Queen, you know, and put them in a foxhole and, and get a, a, a British GI waking up, looking at the Queen, polishing his boots for the Grand Parade, you know, real corn stuff. But the British <laughs> la lapped it up like a cat cream. They were so pleased. Good, good show, Conan. Lovely photography and a tricky Korean sunshine. You know. So I went on and made other films for the British Anglican Church that had a ruins of a cathedral next to the American Embassy in Korea. And then went on and worked for alphabetic soups, voluntary agencies uh, for UNESCO and for in the end a Syracuse University contract to try to upgrade the quality of Korean films and to set up an, uh, some units that would make uh, documentary films to help the nation building. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to say, I felt that the government was so corrupt that it would fall. Right? And I wanted to stay and see the fall of Sigmund Rhee, and that's one reason I accepted uh, the Syracuse contract, even though it, it didn't give me as much uh, income as some of the previous work that I had done for various UN agencies and, 
and foreign agencies. So I had a variety of different clients and the different bureaucracies to report to in Korea, and I stayed Korea till, till, till after the uh, student revolution and some of the initial trials of people. And it was then clear to me that there might well be a coup, and I wanted to get out before the coup. So I, I'm, and there were, I had made quite a, a number of enemies, so I was never packed so joyfully as some of the people who wanted to get me out of Korea. And I, but I was able to take a large amount of film out. Mm -hmm. And I've been collecting mad films, including the one on General Coulter, which I didn't agree with, but I thought it was interesting, and uh, other things. And I had got some North Korean material and all kinds of material, which uh, Columbia now has. Right. You, uh, so you worked with some of the early post-war Korean filmmakers in Korea who then went on to become quite well-known, H.P. Lee, Lee Hyung-pyo, Shin sang Sang particularly. Yes. Can you tell she, us a bit about that, what you did with them or yeah, for them? Yeah, well, um, H.P. Lee had made films for the U USIS. He was originally taught uh, uh, painting, but he, he, he did not get paid very much as an adjunct professor. So in order to feed his family, he went to work for the U U.S. Before, uh, uh, be just before, before the uh, invasion of the North and was making films in, uh, in, uh, for them. When the, when the um, Korean, North Koreans invaded, uh, the American embassy was in such disarray, they did not destroy the personnel records. And so one of the first things the North Koreans did when they came in was look at the personnel records and round up the people who had worked the American embassy, who they, they shot and cried in public trials. And which photograph? You can get uh, from the American army uh, some of that material, with, uh, which in the North Korean material. And Re Sigmund, I mean, H.P. Uh, Lee said, no, 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 I'm not the H.P. Lee that made films for the U.S. I am H.P. Lee the artist, because he had exhibited and so on. And, and so they put him to paint big cinema posters, uh, you know, for the Russian and North Korean films. And eventually he escaped, he went back to South Korea, he went back working for the USIS, and had that USIS had then built a very big laboratory and production facility in Chinhae, and uh, Ridgeway, he produced I Am A Truck, by the way, which I think is a superb film. I had nothing to do with it, but I collected it because I thought it was a, a, a very, very uh, interesting film, and he was he was a very interesting man, an engineer also, but a, a very great sense of what you could do with film. Um, and then uh, he suggested that um, I won't bore you with the details; they're quite quite amusing and sad. But in, in he suggested that H.P. Uh, Lee come to work for uh, with me and and uh, this character Alfred Wagg. Um, in Seoul, and so we joined the unit, and he and I, the others disappeared in various stories, which I won't go into, but in the end, when the dust had settled, H.P. Lee and I were still around, and we continued to do work for the, U for the UN and also other voluntary organizations like Save the Children and uh, the Quakers, uh, who were part of the effort to provide uh, a, some uh, relief from the, the poverty and chaos uh, which, had, which the war had caused. Remember that Seoul, that the battle went from Seoul several times back and forth before the armistice finally settled things. And uh, we, uh, one of the, our jobs was to cover the uh, truce talks. Hmm. So I, I would drive up to um, uh, Pam and John, Fu Moon Sun E, and sometimes when it, it was clear there was going to be a lot of action up there, I would spend the night in a in an abandoned railway car, which was being used by the press corps in, in Munson as a headquarters for covering the uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, truce talks. One of the nice features about it, we had a direct line out so that you could dial in, uh, phone calls in Washington and New York from one phone. And when uh, in the nighttime, when the brass were around, we used to use it for personal calls. So I'd wake up my friends in the morning 
in the evening of being soul and let them hear the sound of the battle because up, up in the air were a firecracker show, an enormous, uh, both sides were, um, Pamunjom was just in, inside the North Korean line and so there was an enormous uh, activity on both sides. We were always afraid that a, uh, a badly aimed shell would blow up the, 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 uh, the, the car with the, the, as one sign said, beneath these portals walk the finest correspondence in the world and since the liquor was free, another poster said, beneath these portals crawl the finest car. You're a sensitive person and you were able to survive in a very right-wing environment under Sigmund Rhee. How do you do that? How does someone live with himself and see the corruption and see the degeneration and still carry on to do some good work in that environment? Well, in that sense, you know, that's... Uh, my son went to Harvard and studied philosophy, but basically Harvard taught, taught him how to survive in academe. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for the uh, interesting philosophy you have collected. I I'm just uh, wondering whether you can explain uh, uh, the one film that we didn't see today, it's about concerning UN review. I'm sorry, could you talk more slowly? Can you explain the film that we didn't see today, which was about the UN review? Correct. Can you explain what kind of film that is and uh, who made that film? We, we were going to show a, a short uh, UN Office of Public Information film. Uh, it's about a five-minute film, but they were regularly shown by the UN, right? And you had a hand in, in making that. Oh, yeah, I had a hand in making uh, some of them, yes. The, the a film you have, and for example, there was a party OPI held celebrating the uh, election of Sigmund Rhee just before he was uh, overthrown by the students, mm -hmm. and I included some excerpts of that. I made a, a showreel for the Hawaii, had, uh, University of Hawaii was very interested, and I gave them and uh, some old newsreels of art exhibitions, also in my wife's world, uh, uh, and, and, they, they have, and some newsreels, and a copy of the radio show, the, 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 um, the Long Walk, which was mostly has material I collected in Korea, plus some interviews I did in New York, and of course the narration was done by Frederick Rach. Uh, if you don't have a copy of that in your files, let me know. I'll provide it. But the Hawaii liked that very much, and uh, but they were a little frightened by the, by, uh, for example, one of their uh, 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 academic types went to, uh, I saw and gave a lot of recordings of Korean music, and I had some very good ones that I had collected from the North Koreans, and she didn't want to touch it. She was frightened anything that came from North Korea, she might be in trouble with University of Hawaii, so I just gave her safe uh, South Korean musicians. Um, and there was this kind of, a, still sort of the shadow of McCarthyism, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it certainly affected uh, the way they handled my material. But I did give them a lot, uh, but there was some rivalry between Hawaii and Harvard, so as I settled into Cambridge and working in television in Cambridge for WGBH and so on, I tended not to give it material to uh, Hawaii, but to give it to Cambridge. And now, of course, Harvard shift has shifted, and they they have a very much they are very much fascinated by the militarization of Korea when the when the uh, coup came in and and how it built up Korean industry and so on. And I tend to disagree with many of, 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 of I don't sing the song of praises of of the Korean generals to the extent that some of the people at Harvard do. We now move into the more conventionally academic part of the day, and we are very pleased to have three speakers here. Uh, beginning with uh, down at the end, uh, we're very happy to have with us all the way from Seoul, uh, uh, Byung Hun Lee, the director of the Korean Film Archive, who will be giving a, a brief presentation in Korean, which will be then interpreted. Stephen Chung, Assistant Professor of East Asian Studies at Princeton, uh, expert in modern Korean film, who will be speaking on Cold War and cinema in Korea. And Greg Brzezinski uh, from the History Department at George Washington University, who has written on the 
post-war reconstruction period in Korea, and we'll discuss the U.S., the U.N., and Korean reconstruction. 안녕하십니까 한국 영상 자료 원장 이병훈입니다. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lee Byung-ho, and I am the director of Korean Film Archive. 제가 네살때 한국 전쟁이 일어났습니다. The Korean War happened when I was four, when I was four years old. 힘들고 어려웠던 어린 시절을 잘 기록해 오늘 다시 되돌아볼 수 있게 해준 테드 코넌트 씨께 감사드립니다. I'd like to say special thanks to Ted Conan for giving me this opportunity to introduce my childhood memory. 필름 속에 폐허와 가난에 찌든 사람들의 모습이 생생하게 기억되고 있습니다. In the film, we'll see the people in the society of Korea which struggled in, in poverty. 많은 우방이 도와줘서 오늘 한국은 큰 발전을 이뤘고 세계 10위권의 경제력과 유엔 사무총장 그리고 세계 은행 총재를 배출하게 됐습니다. By the help of our truthful alliance, we found ourselves in the top 10 economic country among the world and acquired General, uh, General Secretary of the United, United Nations and the Vice President of the World Bank. 과거를 되돌아보게 해준 영상 자료의 힘을 다시 한번 절감하는 자리를 만들어 준 모든 분께 감사드리면서 발표를 시작하겠습니다. I'd like to thanks to everyone uh, who brought this opportunity to share my speech. 한국 영상 자료는 한국 유일의 필름 아카이브로 중앙 정부인 문화체육관광부 산하 기관입니다. Korean Film Archive is the only film archive in Korea which is of uh, affiliated with the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism. 1974년 한국 필름 보관소라는 이름으로 설립되어서 91년도에 한국 영상 자료원으로 명칭을 변경하여 오늘에 이르렀습니다. It was founded in January of 1974 as Korean Film Depository. It has been using the present name Korean Film Archive since 1991. 1996년에는 국내 영화 필름 등의 제출 제도가 시행되어 어, 영화 필름 보존을 위한 뭐 법적 장치가 마련되었으며 그 2002년 어, 피아프 서울총회를 개최하여 어, 영상 자료원의 위상이 강화되는 계기를 마련하였습니다. In 1996, the legacy system for preservation of motion picture films came in place with the implementation of film deposit system of Korean film. And in 2002, International Federation of Film Archive, which is known as FIAF, convened in a meeting in Seoul, which served as momentum to promote the name of Korean Film Archive in the world. In 2007, the it moved to the present location in May 2007. It has now two theaters, a film museum, and a film library, and became the institution for collection, preservation, rest uh, restoration, and application of historical material in relation to Korean motion picture films. 영상 자료의 수집은 국내 영화 필름 납본을 포함해 국내외에 산재해 있는 극영화 및 영상 기록물, 영화 관련 자료를 수집하는 일입니다. The collection of material includes domestic films, specimen, copies, fiction films, documentary film, and film related material in Korea abroad. 한국에서는 1919년 김도산 감독의 의리적 투구를 시작으로 6,400여 편의 영화가 만들어졌습니다. In Korea, 6425 films are produced since the first film, The Fight for Justice in 1919, directed by Kim Do-san. 그러나 아쉽게도 한국 영상 자료원의 보유 중인 영화 필름은 전체의 65% 정도인 4,200여 편에 불과합니다. It is regrettable, however, that only 4,203 films of 60, uh, 6,425 films are presently in custody of a Korean film archive. 1990년대 이후 영화 필름 의무 제도가 생기면서 어, 안전하게 보존되지만 1970년대 이전에 만들어진 영화는 40% 정도밖에 남아 있지 않습니다. 
Films made in 1990s and thereafter are in the safe hands of Korean film archives thanks to the mandatory film deposit system, but many of the made before 1970s are missing and only about 40% of them are in Korean archive. 현재 영상 자료는 적극적인 국내외 자료 조사와 해외 각국 아카이브들과의 교류를 통해 활발한 수집 활동을 하고 있습니다. Korean Film Archive is working hard together, uh, working hard to gather material through research in Korea and cooperation with the foreign archives, archivists. 영상 자료원이 현재 보유하고 있는 자료는 극영화 해외작 포함해서 7,500여 편. 비극 영화 3천여 편을 비롯해 영화 관련 도서 4만여 권, 시나리오 6만 4천여 권, 포스타 1만 7천 6백여 점, 음반 자료 13만 점 등입니다. The current collection of Korean film archive has more than 7,500 fiction films, including foreign film, 3,000 documentary film, over 40,000 film related books, over 64,000 scenarios, over 17. 1,600 movie posters and 133,000 records. 영상 자료는 한국 영화사 연구 토대 구축과 한국 영화사의 대중화, 즉 연구 발간 사업에도 중점을 두고 있습니다. Korean Film Archive is focusing on laying the laying the groundwork for the study and popularization of the Korean film history that is research and publication. 원로 영화인 구술사와 한국 영화 자료 청소 사업을 통해 한국 영화의 사료 정리 가공해 국내외 한국 영화사 연구자들의 연구 기반을 만드는 일을 추진해 오고 있습니다. It has been moving ahead with the project of laying groundwork for the study of Korean film history of film scholars, domestic and foreign, through the publication of oral history, senior movie stars, and the collection of Korean film materials. 또한 한국 영화사 지식 및 정보를 일반인들이 보다 친근하게 접근할 수 있도록 한국 고전 영화 DVD 컬렉션, 포켓 북 시리즈 등을 제작 배포하여 어, 하고 있습니다. In further produces and distributes DVD collections of Korean classical movies, pocket book series, etc. for the general public to have an easy access to knowledge and information of Korean movie history which is well received. I first want to say thanks very much uh, uh, to Charles, uh, to Jim, uh, and to Ms. Shin as well for organizing, organizing this event. It's a thrill to be here um, precisely because uh, um, Mr. Conant's work is sort of central, will be central to uh, my next research project. And it was, in fact, uh, Mr. Conant's films, which have sort of served as a kind of a, a seed uh, for even thinking about some of the directions of this work. So I'm, I'm quite thrilled to be here. In fact, I think it was uh, six or seven years ago that I first met uh, Lee Young-pyo here in New York City. Uh, I think his brother uh, lives here, might, might still do so. And he stressed uh, uh, very strongly that I uh, get to know your work. And in fact, uh, often spoke of you as being a, a, a really sort of central part of post-war uh, film uh, industry. And indeed, uh, the more research that I do, um, the more apparent that becomes. Um, and it's, I don't think it's uh, much of a coincidence at all that uh, those filmmakers that uh, Mr. Conant worked with uh, directly uh, happen to be among the most uh, accomplished technicians of their time. Uh, and I think that owes a lot to your uh, counsel. Um, so, um, okay. What I uh, am going to do here, um, because Charles didn't ask me to speak about uh, Mr. Conant's films, I mean, we have the benefit of actually seeing them uh, today, so there was a, a little point in uh, me uh, bumbling and trying to uh, unfold his films for you. Uh, but I, what I would like to do is uh, present a small fragment of what's going to be uh, a kind of insane research project which uh, deals with uh, what I'm calling Cold War optics, uh, which is thinking about uh, the relationship, the mutually constitutive relationship between uh, war and cinema uh, in the uh, Cold War period. Um, and in here, I'm focusing my, my uh, ideas on Korea uh, specifically. The project for me starts with um, a two uh, major um, prompts, I suppose. Uh, the first is that um, uh, 
Um, while, while film studies has uh, largely clustered around uh, two historical periods, uh, that is, uh, its early phases in the early 20th century up until arguably the 20s and early 30s, um, and also uh, in the last 10 or 15 years, um, thinking about the impact of digital technology. Um, the, the precise sort of uh, uh, the impact of film technology uh, in the mid-century, um, and particularly its, its technologies, I don't think have been fully explored. Uh, and it sort of comes down to, for me to a question of um, what form, right, what form of visualization uh, was peculiar to the Cold War? It's sort of uh, one uh, major sort of prompt of this project. Um, the other one is that um, I think that films like uh, the ones that uh, Mr. Conant uh, 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 produced uh, in the 50s and into the 60s might provide some clues into thinking about or sort of helping us uh, yield a different sort of engagement with the Cold War. Uh, one that is uh, maybe a, a slightly different narrative than uh, a, a superpower conflict and its client states. And I think it's precisely in documentaries and newsreels uh, uh, that were made in this period that a, a kind of more honest engagement uh, with the experience, the everyday experience of the Cold War uh, could be available. So um, I'm going to show um, a couple of clips. Um, this, is, this was also uh, recently um, uh, rediscovered uh, by, the, by an agent, uh, sorry, uh, uh, a researcher at the Korean Film Archive, uh, Kim Han-sang, uh, which is closely related to um, uh, Mr. Conant's work. It's a 1954 film called Box of Death, Jugum and Sangja. Um, and it was uh, uh, directed by uh, Kim Gi-young uh, under the auspices of the USIS. Um, let me just show this uh, very quickly. It's a silent. It's not a silent film. It's a, it's a sound film. But uh, apparently, the soundtrack uh, was destroyed, um, which is just as well. Um, uh, it's a it's a it's a, a fairly simple film. Uh, it's a, uh, it sort of deals with uh, uh, communist infiltration uh, into the South, um, and it's in in my mind, it's 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 in many ways an archetypal uh, sort of anti-communist film. Uh, this figure on the left is the infiltrator. Um, he is sort of masking as uh, the, the um, uh, fellow soldier of a, of a uh, so, sorry, a, a fellow of a soldier that's died. Uh, what I want to uh, point out are shots like this one, where, uh, in typical fashion, uh, the, the North Korean sympathizer or a guerrilla or infiltrator. Uh, is photographed uh, in these very sort of sinister uh, ways, um, up, uh, sort of uh, low lighting and such. And so we have a sort of cinematic demonization of, of the uh, North Korean partisan. Right? Um, more to the point is that this was a, a film that was produced as late as 1954. And as you can see, uh, uh, even if you can see through the per preservation, um, there are a number of problems uh, with the film itself. Uh, the, the grammar is, is fairly uh, uh, rudimentary. Uh, the shots uh, aren't, aren't uh, composed uh, uh, perfectly. And I think it's no coincidence then that uh, 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 Mr. Conant's uh, work in the early 50s through the late 50s was sort of instrumental in pushing uh, the Korean film industry uh, towards uh, films uh, like this one, which was made in 1958. Uh, a film called Hellflower, directed by uh, a, film, a prominent filmmaker that Mr. Khan has already mentioned, uh, Shin sang -wok. Let's watch a brief clip of that. Uh, there's so what you have here is uh, um, sort of documentary footage uh, near base camp, which in that moment uh, cuts uh, fairly uh, seamlessly uh, to um, uh, this narrative uh, filmmaking sequence. Um, that's actually fine. Uh, the sound isn't crucial. Um, um, so please keep that one in mind. And then finally, uh, one more clip. 
This is uh, the celebrated uh, last sequence of this film uh, where one of the brothers uh, that Cheyoni's character uh, uh, plays uh, uh, is, um, was jilted and is now uh, seeking his revenge against uh, his lover. Um, I actually was invited to give uh, historical background to these films. Um, unfortunately, because I teach uh, late evening classes on Thursday, uh, I got here too late to see uh, many of the films myself, uh, but I, was, I sort of know the general content, so I'm going to give sort of a background uh, about, uh, you know, about the, the era when the film was made. Um, you know, basically these films cover to, in part, the efforts of the United Nations Korea Reconstruction Agency, uh, which was formed in 1951 to help with the reconstruction of South Korea. The Korean War had been a horrifically destructive conflict for both North and South Korea. It was a protracted, brutal three-year war that saw the dispatch of hundreds of thousands of foreign troops to the relatively limited geographic confines of the Korean Peninsula. The amount of destruction which was left over by these armies was vast. In South Korea alone, the war annihilated 900 industrial plants, destroyed 600,000 homes, wiped out more than half of the country's freight, freight cars, trucks, and locomotives. By the end of the war, more than five million South Koreans lived in emergency shacks uh, of the kind that are depicted here. And on top of this, you had other problems, uh, health problems ravaged South Korea. There, was, there were uh, communicable, communicable diseases uh, were widespread, including tuberculosis. Uh, and, you know, basically in a society that lacked anything resembling a safety net, uh, there were thousands of children that had been orphaned by the war. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, but these problems, these economic and social problems were all compounded by the collapse of the economic order that had existed on the Korean Peninsula during the Japanese colonial period. Between 1910 in 1945, the economy of the Korean Peninsula had been tightly integrated with those of northeastern China and Imperial Japan. So even before the war ended, there was broad recognition of the fact that South Korea was going to need a massive reconstruction effort if it was going to survive as a viable independent state. And in the period immediately following the Korean War, the United States worked together with the United Nations to create a massive economic assistance program geared at rehabilitating the Republic of Korea. There were several new official aid organizations that were established that had parallel and overlapping agendas. The United Nations Command created a new Office of the Economic Coordinator, or OEC, that was charged with dispensing more than $300 million in economic aid annually on the Korean Peninsula. While the OEC was charged primarily with coordinating economic development projects and working with South Korean bureaucrats to set economic policy, the United Nations Reconstruction Agency, or UNKRA, took more of a bottom-up approach to aiding post-war South Korea. The UNKRA received $158 million in contribution to conduct reconstruction work in South Korea, um, contributions received from various member countries in the United Nations. The work of these official agencies was supplemented by that of numerous private religious and philanthropic organizations. During the years after the Korean War, the Asia Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Ford Foundation all launched different kinds of private initiatives in South Korea. Christian missionaries had long been part 
of the cultural landscape in Korea during the years after the Korean War, many American denominations that had not been previously active in South Korea, such as the Southern Baptists and Latter-day Saints, also began to dispatch missionaries to South Korea, and these new missions added in many ways to the relief effort, uh, which they thought as a critical, they thought of this as a critical part of their obligation to aiding the struggling countries. How is this assistance used? As I've already alluded to, a significant amount of the aid went to meeting the basic needs of the Korean people, which were uh, dire after the Korean War. Uh, there were, uh, there were, there were massive, uh, massive relief efforts. Orphaned children, uh, and I have a few uh, slides here, were sort of one of the key, uh, were one of the key focal points of a lot of these relief efforts. Uh, during the war itself, uh, many such children had been aided through collections from American combat units fighting in Korea, and here uh, you have a couple of pictures of Korean orphans uh, around military bases receiving uh, different kinds of assistance uh, from American units. The OEC, the UNKRA, and others sought not only to aid the country's re basic reconstruction, but also to begin the transformation of its citizenry into democratic subjects. Many of the programs launched by the UNKRA during and immediately after the Korean War were designed very specifically to inculcate South Koreans with a specific set of values that Americans considered it necessary for them to possess if the Republic of Korea was going to survive and thrive as an American ally. This could be seen in particular in some of the programs that the UNKRA devised to aid South Korea's educational system. On the one hand, American uh, relief agencies helped to provide construction materials and labor that could rebuild the thousands of South Korean schools that were destroyed by the war. But on the other hand, these programs also sought to transform both the contents and the methods that were used in South Korean schools. Teacher training programs tried to discourage what they believed were the authoritarian methods of teaching that had been left as a legacy of Japanese colonialism and Korea's more distant past and replaced them with new methods that could better train a democratic citizenry. A report on South Korean education published by the UNKRA, for instance, called for methods that would allow students to gain knowledge, skills, competencies, and attitudes and use them in the pursuit of individual and group goals and the solutions of problems that are real to learners. Through such programs, the UNKRA ultimately hoped to instill in South Korean students a new participatory ethos that would prepare them for their obligations as citizens in a democracy. Agencies such as the UNKRA also, provide, uh, also presided over changes in the textbooks and other materials that were used in South Korean schools. Americans involved in these efforts, again, often sought to influence the content of what South Korean children were taught and make sure that the new material reflected a pro-American and anti-communist outlook. <laughs> Feel necessity to say it breaks my heart. Here it said that the re this was the reconstruction of a nation, but the nation had two pieces. And this was the UN taking one side and constructing it so as to prevent the reconstruction of a nation. So it's a, I think that the problem in looking at this period of time is to start in June of 1950 and not to look at what happened in 1945. So um, it would have been good maybe to see some of the North Korean footage if there was some, or some balance so we could see Korea as a nation rather than as disconstructed two pieces. I to say that I, I guess I, this is Greg, um, it just seems to me that what you say leaves out that there was a whole anti-Japanese struggle and the South Korean people were very progressive, understood participation, understood uh, democracy probably much better than the U.S. 
people who were brought in, and certainly the UN activity that, that separated the nation. And so it just, it's very important, I think, not to adopt the UN and the US propaganda of that, that made it possible to do the division and that suppressed that progressive fight of the people against, um, that had been part of the fight against the Japanese occupation and expected to be able to have the fruits of that when the war was over. And so I, I just, it makes me very uncomfortable that, you know, without any context that understands that, to be adopting and not understanding um, you know, what, what that, the propaganda nature of that is. And I think Mr. Conan's contribution is helpful in somehow having that bigger perspective. From the, a little bit the overlapping these two areas. Uh, the boy in the film is myself. Huh? Oh, huh? Not really. Not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, hit by the uh, U.S. airplane, and my family, my home, burned, and uh, I have a big scar still, and it's still affecting my health. I go out of country now every two weeks. So. This question is to Mr. Bradinsky. I agree, very good. That's what I believe. Let me just uh, try to go back and say what I am saying and what I'm not saying about uh, America's contribution to democracy in South Korea. I'm not saying that South Korea is de democratic today solely because of the United States. Uh, that's, that's, that was, um, you know, I, I tried to make that very clear uh, in my presentation. I am arguing that the United States created a context in some degree where democratic ideas could at least be discussed and debated and talked about. That was quite different from North Korea, right? If you look at what the Soviets did there. Um, I, I, I think that was, I, I do think it was a difference. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that American policy was completely beneficent. I'm not saying that it was not self-interested at some level. May I bring it back to imagery and cinema? Yes, <laughs> please. I'm curious if maybe uh, Chen could speak a little bit more about, since I'm rather ignorant of cinema, cinema and imagery and symbolism of this period, what are some of the, um, the most significant, the iconic, one might say, of images of this period from cinema that are symbolic of the period? And how much of that was conscious creation by the Korean um, people involved, you know, directors or whatever, and how much of it was sort of an unconscious reflection of the period? Uh, I don't feel equipped right now to speak about what sort of the dominant images were. Uh, there was one image that I was working on that I was uh, most sort of pushed on by which was uh, taken from uh, some footage uh, uh, shot in early 70s in Hanoi. Um, so this is moving away from Korea. Um, but it actually, there was echoes of it in, in Mr. Conant's work where um, embedded uh, journalists and filmmakers, feature filmmakers, documentarians, newsreel uh, producers, were at the front lines of the conflict. And indeed, the front line and home front and this sort of thing were uh, ambiguous anyway in Vietnam, Korea, and different parts of uh, East, East Asia. Uh, and that particular image was of a um, U.S. or whatever it was, uh, aircraft bombing the city. Um, except that um, the problem was that when this, when this black and white film was sent to developers in Paris, they had developed it as a, uh, through color uh, uh, technologies. And so what you have is this very strange uh, kind of negative image of, of, a, of a bomber uh, attacking me, essentially. Uh, and for me, that embodied all of the sort of contradictions and, and sort of technological kind of foundations of Cold War cinema uh, in Asia, uh, really sort of uneven uh, conflict, um, sort of quasi sort of crude technologies, but a real sort of engagement with the fear and sort of menace uh, of the war. So, yeah. I think we have
we really are out of time. So I want to thank all of you for coming. Thank the panelists. Thank Director Lee. And thank you, Chair Tom.